I think that really my story began when both of my parents were facing their end of life. They lived in Palos Verdes as well. My mom became ill first. She actually had some pretty serious ups and downs, but her last 40 days were actually spent at Little Company Mary Hospital and the last few in the hospice suites. And so I became very grateful to the ways that they tended to her uh, towards the end uh, because she was unable able to be at home where she really wanted to be. They allowed me to stay overnight. They allowed me to spend as much time as I wanted to and needed to be with her up until the very end. And then about two years later, my father became ill and I was able to spend a great deal of time with him too. But it really became clear to me that being with people at the end of their lives was something that I really could do. So when I heard about the No One Dies Alone program, I thought that this would be a way to continue to honor my parents' legacy. Basically, the way it worked is if there was a patient that had no one, you would get an email, and then you would just sign up and go and sit with whoever this person might be. I knew that the next thing I wanted to do needed to really be significant. I knew that I really wanted to find something that would make a difference. I remember this one guy, younger fellow, and I went and visited him several times, and one of the first things I learned from him was that he loved the Rolling Stones. So we got some Rolling Stones tapes, and he just listened to the Rolling Stones for the next 72 hours. Occasionally, someone would be really wanting to talk about their anxiety, but for the most part, it was just a quiet presence, just being being there. I collect these stories, and I've talked to many and listened to many who are volunteer hospice workers, Mm -hmm. and it often seems like someone is either waiting for someone to show up before they go or maybe waiting for them to leave the room. It's surprising to me how much control it seems almost like someone has in, in those final few moments of their life. With my dad, I he died the day after Christmas. We all knew he would not die on Christmas Day because he just loved Christmas entirely too much. And my son and I had gone over. He just chatted for a while and it was pretty clear that it was It was getting close, and I really, really sensed that he did not want my son there. And so we left, and my brother and his wife came, and we drove, Troy and I drove from Long Beach to Palos Verdes, and in that period of time, my dad had passed. But my brother said that dad opened his eyes, and he said, I need to be clean-shaven on my way up. So he gave him a shave, and that was... That was it. Oh, wow. A few days before that, I'd been over to his house, and he was laying in bed, and he was going like, Dad, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm eating the rose petals. I said, you're eating the rose petals. Okay. I didn't see any rose petals, but he just kept eating the rose petals. And he said, she keeps bringing them to me, and I think that if I eat them, she'll keep coming back. Well, it was my mother, because my mother grew roses. And so it was really her way of inviting him in, because he, she was very ready, and he really was not. And so I think that the roses really gave him that encouragement that she was the okay yeah she was the okay she's i'm here